you very much. We're in for a real treat for the next 40 minutes or so. And uh, I'd like to walk, welcome Saul Khan up to the stage with me. Saul, please. Saul, Saul is for sure uh, one of our heroes. And I think as you'll quickly see, he's, uh, he, he's more than that. He's, he's a, a wonderful, wonderful man who's doing amazing work. If you turn that down just a little. Saul's Academy, Saul Khan Academy, has taught millions of people. And Forbes calls it the largest school in the world. Uh, Bill Gates, just a few feet from here, called Saul a true pioneer. And he's written a new book. If you haven't seen it, we'll uh, get around talking about this here. It's called The One, Room, One World Schoolhouse. And I, I highly recommend that to you. It describes a vision for education that's pretty mind-blowing. So I'm very pleased to be in this conversation with Saul. Just a little over three years ago, 36 months ago, he was one man working in a walk-in closet. 12 months before that, uh, Khan Academy was his kind of oddball hobby. He was an intellectually hyperactive hedge fund analyst. Fast forward to today, Khan Academy has more than 85 million users, more than 6 million unique users a month, where 220 million lessons have been learned, over a billion exercises have been completed. Pretty mind-blowing for a hyperactive hedge fund dropout who was struggling to make ends meet in his closet. <laughs> now, just to put all this in perspective, online education is not entirely new. Harvard began offering online education in 1997. Global spending on education is $3.9 trillion, over $1.3 trillion in, in the United States. But uh, all's not so sunny. As, as, as you know, uh, the US ranks 25th out of 30, 34 developing countries in our math achievements. And there's an even deeper divide. That's that 23% of 15-year-olds, Americans, can't use math in their daily lives. So I, I want to tell you Saul's story, but I first want to connect to your experience with Khan Academy. A, sh a show of hands, please. Uh, how many of us here uh, know of Khan Academy? Everyone. Now, uh, keep your hands up if you've completed a Khan Academy lesson. And keep your hands up, please, if you have completed a lesson with your child. Uh huh. And put your hands up now if you have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'll tell you what I'd like to do is I'd like, I'd like to introduce, if I can, Saul, a montage that shows excerpts of the Khan Academy curriculum. If uh, you'd roll the first video, please. We could integrate over the surface, and the notation usually is a capital sigma. All of these interactions are just due to the gravity over interstellar, or almost you could call it intergalactic. This animal's fossils are only found in this area of South America, a nice clean band here. Notice this is an aldehyde, and it's an alcohol. This is their 30 million plus the $20 million from the American manufacturer. They create the Committee of Public Safety, which sounds like a very nice committee. This Botticelli. is not you. No, Botticelli's portrayed the ancient goddess of love. This is 6 times 6 times 6, or 216. I'm told the humidity makes it feel hotter. <laughs> with the pendulum and get a feel for how it moves. Function as a bridge rectifier. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. If this does not blow your mind, <laughs> then you have no emotion. <laughs> so Saul Khan grew up poor, uh, raised by a single mom in Metairie, Louisiana, whose claim to fame is that that town elected uh, white supremacist David Duke to the state assembly. <laughs> but Saul's intellectual gifts allowed him to escape that town national math competitions, took him to MIT, where you earned two degrees, two undergraduate degrees, and a master's degree in four years, primarily by skipping classes. Isn't that correct? <laughs> and, and was that a harbinger then for the Khan philosophy Perhaps. of education? So, so, so then you went from there to tutoring your cousin Nadia, which led you to YouTube, which led you to quit a very lucrative job in 2009 as a hedge fund analyst with an infant son and your wife, Umama, who had not yet completed her medical career. What did Umama say 
when you quit. <laughs> yes, and you're talking about my umama. Yes, umama, not yes. my mother. Yes, but yes. <laughs> no, it, it was you know she had seen it coming for a long time. I mean, you go back to 2000 and. When I started tutoring my cousins, she saw that that was a kind of a passion that I was building. Word had gotten around in the family that free tutoring was going on, so I found myself with many cousins uh, every day after work, and my wife was observing that. Um, and then, you know, you, you fast forward a little bit. I started writing software for them, to, for them to practice. And, you know, my wife saw me every day after work, literally, you know, coding this thing together. And uh, at some point, you know, I put a database behind it so I could track my cousins. Uh, and then a friend suggested hey, why don't you put some lessons on YouTube so that um, you, it could help you scale up a little bit. Uh, you know, my first reaction was, no, 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 you know, that, that's for cats playing piano. That's not for uh, serious mathematics. Uh, but, but that happened. I, I, I did it. And then, um, you know, long story short, people who are not my cousins were starting to watch. And uh, they started sending letters. And some of them were just, you know, things like, thank you, and I even, you know, and, and even that was pretty special on YouTube. Um, most <laughs> of the comments are not thank you for any of one who spent much time there. Um, but then we started getting letters, and I literally used to bring my wife over, and I used to say, hey, look, like, this, this letter is coming in from Wyoming, and it's some parent who's saying that this is getting through to their son who has dyslexia, or it's coming from uh, some uh, person who's leaving the military who wants to go back to college, and this is how they're re-engaging with math. So she, she was kind of having that adventure with me, and so... But did she have deep reservations? Yeah, well, you, you could imagine um, she, was, she was supportive of this as a hobby. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but, and, you know, and everyone has bad days at work. And, and, you know, there's a couple of times probably in 2007 or, well, especially in 2008, and we'll probably talk more about that in a... Um, <laughs> we have the secretary to follow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> where, where you're like, maybe, 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 maybe this other thing's what I meant to do, but then you look at your finances and you say, maybe, maybe not yet. But by, by 2009, um, yeah, it, it was just, she could tell that my, this was where my heart was, this was where my mind was. She saw that we were getting traction in, in terms of users. It was growing every month. Um, she was getting, seeing the letters that we were did, getting from did people. Did she put you on a budget, a time budget or a financial budget? We, we kind of together decided that let's give it a year. Let's, let's year. see if, if, if in the next year we had a, a, about enough savings for a, it was good savings, but it was about a down payment on a, a house in the area. About and, how much? Um, it, was, it was a couple hundred thousand dollars. Uh -huh. and, um, and so we figured like we could live for you know, a year and eat into that, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we, we realized we couldn't do much more. So how that. close did you get to the edge? Uh, well, uh, I quit my job in fall of, of uh, 2009, uh, kind of assuming that, oh, this is a no-brainer. The social return on investment is just through the roof. We were already at that time, I think, reaching 100,000 students. And, uh, but I think like any entrepreneurial, and you know a lot about entrepreneurial stories, you start off in this very naive point and you assume it's just going to be a kind of a very easy next few months, and then you start getting rejected and rejected and rejected. Um, and, and frankly, that, that, hap that kept happening for about nine months until uh, you know, a, a couple by the name of the door showed up, um, and, and things changed a little bit. So um, you were drawn to this by experiences with your cousin, right? What did you learn from tutoring Nadia that informed this work? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because Nadia, it was, she, by, by all measures, was a good student. She went to a, a, a good school in New Orleans. Uh, she, for the most part, was an A student, A minus, every now and then a B student. And, and so it was, it, was, it was pretty shocking to me when I found out in, when she had visited me right after our wedding in Boston, actually her mom told me, uh, that Nadia is having trouble in math, and that because of that, she's being placed into a slower math track. And I don't think even her mom fully appreciated all the repercussions that would have. She wouldn't take algebra with the advanced students, and she wouldn't take calculus in high school, and she would have trouble getting into a competitive college. And when I talked to Nadia about it, I, I, I asked what's going on, and it was unit conversion. And I said, well, I'm, I'm confident that you can understand this, but she was skeptical. Um, but what I, what I realized when I started working with her over the phone is that even this student that the system was saying is, well, on one level, she was getting good grades, but then the system is kind of holding back. She had all of these gaps in her knowledge, that just getting A minuses and Bs, well, when you get a B, that's 10% you didn't know, and then the system kind of moves you forward. And at some point, or you know, even with unit conversion, because of this one gap in her knowledge, she was being tracked into her slower track. And so uh, one is the discovery of, of even good students have these gaps, but then the reality that if you work with someone in a, in a very intense way, we were on the phone every day for a month, uh, you know, eventually, you know, at first she was just checked out. She thought were, she was no good at math. Were you using a computer? 
We, at first, we were just using speakerphone, and then we realized that we needed to see what writing somehow, so we used Yahoo Doodle. Uh -huh. uh, and we used our, my, our, our mice to, uh, to, <laughs> to, 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 mouses, to, to write. <laughs> Um, Let me go to Khan, I'll and check. Then, and, then, and then I, <laughs> the other day I, I wanted to look up something on heart disease, yes. and, and I do a search, video search, I was like, oh, this is a good video. I was like, oh, I made this. this, is, this, is, this is, How many videos this have, is, wait a minute, wait a minute, we're going to get back now. How many videos have you made? Uh, uh, 3,500. And how many of them do you remember? Um, well, I, I remember making all of them, almost all of them. But yes, I, I, you know, if you ask me about you know the, the details of ischemia right now, I would have to review a little bit. You, you but, did one on the financial system, though, that was very popular, right? Yes, you know, actually, I mean, that's what most people don't realize. When 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 people associate the Khan Academy, they tend to think K through 12, and I started with my cousins. But uh, one thing I found myself as early as 2007, a lot of the junior analysts were, you know, these were people with you know, 4.0 GPAs from Ivy League schools with econ degrees, with finance degrees, you know, they didn't understand, you know, basic, basic uh, accounting, or they didn't understand, you know, <laughs> backlog, or how to, like, forward-looking, yeah. and, and so I would start making videos for them. It was, was also during the time that housing prices were going up a lot. Yes. I was getting a lot of pressure from family to buy houses, uh, <laughs> because they can only go up, and um, I started doing a series of videos. It's actually there, and I left them there because it's dated pre- pre-summer of 2008. Oh, these are vintage. These are vintage, but it's on the analysis of, you know, I don't understand why the housing prices are going up, uh, <laughs> salaries aren't going up, uh, population is going up. The only thing that seems to be happening is that lending seems to be getting looser, and I talked up a little bit about that, that circular nature. So, so, so uh, uh, those were out there, and, and then I started having, when the, the, I'm sure we'll hear a lot more about it, when, when the crisis hit, uh, all sorts of people were saying, well, what's a credit default swap? What's a mortgage-backed security? And all that is explained on Khan Academy. Yeah, so I started making videos on that, and you know, did I Did you know that, or did you learn that? The more, well, this was, I mean, this was like my actual job at, at this point, you know, <laughs> right. when the, in, the, in the fall of, of 2008, yeah. um, I think like a lot of people in the industry, I, you know, we, we actually just moved to cash and uh, started reading the Federal Reserve Act over and over and over again. <laughs> Uh, just trying to understand what is possible, what are the tools at the disposal of the Treasury, what are the tools at the disposal okay. of the Fed. Okay, oh, hold on. That's your day job. And then by night, you're on Yahoo Doodle with mice with Nadia. <laughs> well, 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 by this point, yeah, by this point, Khan Academy had already started been, uh, making the videos. But yeah, I was still, I was still working with the cousins okay, as well. Okay, so let's close out the cousin yeah. story. Yeah. What, what else <laughs> did you learn from Nadia that's really important to Khan? Well, the other thing that I learned is that that same young woman who thought that she was no good at math, who thought that unit conversion was just beyond her, if you worked with her really intensely for about a month, uh, she got unit conversion, but then she started to catch up, and then frankly, she got a little ahead, and I, and I, you know, I actually, I, I say I, I became something of a, a tiger cousin at this moment, mm -hmm. and I uh, <laughs> called up her school, and I said, you know, I really think Nadia Rahman should retake that placement test from last year, right. and they said, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'm her cousin. <laughs> um, but that, sa you know, that same Nadia, and, and you know, I, I, I'm not complacent yet. I always tell her a lot's riding on her success. <laughs> but by you know, the same young woman who, at the age of 12, thought that she couldn't get unit conversion, by the time she was in ninth grade, was taking calculus at the University of New Orleans. Wow. So just a good dramatic. Congratulations. Yeah. It's the, the jury's still out on what, what Did she give you any feedback on, on the learning methods and on the, the no? I mean, never, never kind of a direct feedback, but it, it was interesting. I think, you know, the one point that I, I do remember about a month into it, when something clicked in her head and she realized how easy or, or simple unit conversion could be if viewed the right way, it, it, it wasn't, she wasn't even happy about it. She was almost angry because uh -huh. she felt that this thing that was going to determine her whole future that was convincing her that she was no good at mathematics yeah. was such a simple thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of lit a little bit of a fire in her, and that's what drove her after my, that. my understanding is, as generous as it was, she really didn't want you teaching her online in real time. Well, that, you know, that, that was a discovery, really. You know, you, 2004, I started tutoring her, started writing the software. Uh, two years passed by. I, we moved out to Silicon Valley. I started tutoring a lot more cousins. And this was when I, this, this friend said to make the YouTube videos. And when I put those first few videos out there, I, I told my, my cousins, I said, look, you know, these, these things are out there. It's a little brief explanation of least common multiple or factoring polynomials, whatever it is. Why don't you watch those as a refresher, and then we could use our sessions as to go deeper. And after about a couple of months of that, I, I asked them what they thought, and they, they somewhat backhandedly told me that, that they liked me better on YouTube than in person. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> and why is, why is that? Oh, I think it's what you're talking. I mean, I haven't said how broad of a statement that is. I think they enjoy my <laughs> physical company in some ways. But they, um, I, I think it's this idea that, and we've all experienced this. I mean, even now at, at, at Khan Academy, I'll ask a, you know, an engineer, well, how exactly are we, are we sorting or how, are, how exactly are we recommending the right video or exercise for someone to do? And he'll say, oh, it's really easy, Sal. This is the algorithm. It's blah, 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 right? It's really easy. And I'll be like, yeah, 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 that's really easy. And it's the same thing when you're explaining something. You know, when I, I, try my best when, I tried my best when I was with my cousins to be non-judgmental, to go at whatever pace they wanted. But you got to imagine their, their, the pressure they feel when someone says, do you get it? Do you understand it? Who knows where their mind is? Who knows what else they have to do? And so now when they were able to get the videos, they could watch it at midnight. They're in control. They're in control. No one's judging them. They could watch right. it 50 times if they need to. Terrific. So uh, it's the summer of 2010. Savings are dwindling. Walter Isaacson is interviewing Bill Gates over at the other tent there. You haven't met Bill Gates, and you learn that he's learning your videos, and he's teaching his kids with your videos, and you meet Bill Gates. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, no, this, I mean, this was one of a series of just crazy things that started to happen. I mean, even that day, and it literally happened near here, um, I was running a little summer camp with middle school kids, and I had six kids playing a game of risk, and then I had the other 20 trading securities based on the outcome of the game of risk. <laughs> <laughs> it's very good. And I'm not making this up. One seventh grader invented naked shorting on his own. <laughs> Completely. I was like, you're selling something you don't And that's the have. financial yeah. naked shorting, not the other oh, kind, yeah, right? No, 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 no. It was, yeah, no, it was, yeah, the financial, the, yeah. I have some teenage, well, never mind. <laughs> yes. Not. The, um... And while that was happening, Anne and your wife uh, sends me a, a, start, a series of text messages. And she was in, I think, the, this tent or a, a tent nearby. And as you said, uh, you know, uh, Walter Isaacson, Bill Gates were on stage. Um, I didn't know about any of this. And Anne says, at Aspen Ideas Festival, uh, in the main pavilion, uh, last five minutes, Bill Gates talking about Khan Academy. And so I didn't. I, 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 You're kidding. I, yeah, I was like, is this a prank? And it didn't really seem like that type of person. And, and so I immediately, I immediately boot the nearest seventh grader off of a computer, and I start looking for some proof of this thing that, that Anne is talking about. And uh, I actually, it was later that day, they posted it on the site, first an audio transcript and then a, a video. Mm. And yeah, as you said, it was, it was literally Bill Gates saying that he uses it himself, uses it with his kids. And, and it was one of those very out-of-body, strange experiences where on some level you're ecstatic. You're like, this is like the best thing that could ever happen. And on another level, you're like, that's scary. These videos were for Nadia, not <laughs> Bill, Bill Gates. Um, and, then, and then, frankly, it was just very strange because I didn't know what to do next. I, do, I, do I call him? Do I, what's the protocol here? I, I'm assuming he's not listed. And uh, they, they, they actually left me in that situation for about two weeks. So what did you do? I, I did not, I mean, I, I literally Nothing. went home, I, I, I told my wife about it, and she didn't really know what to make of it, and I started, but literally the next two weeks, I just kind of said, well, I guess this happened, if, if I'll go back to making videos, and uh, two weeks later, I got a call from Seattle, you know, hello, and it was Larry Cohen, uh, Bill Gates' chief of staff, and he says, you might have heard, Bill's a fan, yeah, I heard that. <laughs> And uh, if you're free in the near future, we would love to fly you up and find out how we can support uh, what you're doing. And I was looking at my calendar for, for the month, <laughs> completely blank. <laughs> and I, I said, yeah, you know, I got to cut my nails on Wednesday. But other than that, I think I could you know, meet, meet with Bill Gates. But, yeah. And how'd the meeting go? It, 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 went, it went well. I mean, you know, we, <laughs> we, we, we met and, you know, it's... it's uh, uh, well, it's strange because I'm, I'm telling the story about, you know, meeting Bill Gates, who's this iconic person who I grew up kind of, you know, idolizing on a lot of yeah, levels. Sure. And, uh, but I'm also, frankly, on stage with other folks who are at that. Well, anyway, yeah. that's a, this is surreal on a lot of levels. But the, um, yeah, you know, we, we met and he asked what up to. And it was just one of those surreal times in your life where 20 percent of your brain is trying to speak in a cohesive way. And <laughs> the other 80 percent is saying, that's Bill Gates. That's Bill Gates. <laughs> Try to deal with it. Saul, are, are you are you are you just interested in everything? Do you have a passion for learning? Yeah, you know, and, and that's where I think you know people often make it like this very huge change that I did going from the hedge fund world into the into what I do now. They and are they are different. 
they, in some ways they are different, yes. But the one commonality, and this is what, what drew me to my previous career, was that that job really was about trying to understand the world. You know, the same morning I might talk to the largest egg producer in the country, then a software company, then a biotech firm, then a, then a railroad company, and you're trying to figure out, connect the dots between all of them. Uh, and obviously that was with the intent of, you know, generating alpha or, or, or whatever. <laughs> uh, uh, but, but, but the commonality is you got to learn about everything. And I think that's, that is the fun for me, is that now I feel like I do have the best job on the planet is I, I go in the morning and I, and I learn new things and I try to communicate it. So what, what were you thinking when you left the hedge fund world to do something socially useful? <laughs> the, um, you know, I, I didn't even think of it that way. I, I mean, I, 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 I really liked my old career and, you know, the, the hedge fund world sometimes gets a, a, you know, doesn't have the best branding, but... Um, <laughs> But, but there are some really good actors, and, and, and my boss, our portfolio manager, was one of, I mean, he was one of the best ethical, everything else. I mean, I, I credit a lot of the reason why Khan Academy exists to him, because he used to say, look, you need to have a life. We're, about, we're not about making many decisions. We're about making good decisions. You need to be able to go home. You need to be recharged. You need to spend time with your family. And because of that, I was able to go home and work with my cousins. So I, I really love that, and he was an amazing mentor. Uh, but this Khan Academy thing just... It just took over my life. It, it was, you know, when you get letters from people, if you get even one letter, and, and you know, and Ann knows, she comes to a lot of our company updates, is, you know, we read these letters from people all over the planet. What's the letter that's moved you the most? I mean, it's, it's we get, I mean, now we get, it, it's hard to pick, but, you know, in those early days, and this was one of them, I would say, that was was a catalyst for me really quitting, uh, was a, a letter from a, a young man, in, 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 grew up in the South, African-American, uh, didn't go to great schools, diagnosed with a learning disability, kind of, you know, everyone marginalized him. Uh, at some point, uh, I think a little late, he decided to go to community college, and he took it upon himself, because he didn't really, he thought he was bad at math, to look on the web for something, so obviously a very self-motivated individual, and he stumbled on Khan Academy. This was the summer of, I think, 2009, and in August, he wrote a letter saying that he just spent the summer on Khan Academy, and he just took the placement exam at the local community college, and he got a perfect score on it. Which, was, which had never happened at the community college before. And that they immediately said that he has to become a math major, he has to transfer to the, <laughs> to the, to the local four-year college, he has to, and that was kind of a mind-blowing, I mean, if, if just one of those things happened, but you know, and, and so you can imagine, when you see that, that beats any bonus or anything else. Oh, no, that's... What is the hardest thing about the work that you do? Day in, day out. You know, I, it's it's. I mean, I feel like I'm living in. A, you know, uh, this this is this is a dream for me. I I mean, I, I think the hardest thing is the, the uh, you know, we we've gotten to a scale and and we we we're doing a, you know, and, and we could talk more about that. But there's a lot of evidence that this is moving the dial in the right direction. But the problem is so big that we're getting sucked into probably 20 different directions right now. And I think for us, it's really important for us to. <laughs> Uh, make sure we are that we that we're focused, and we're focused on the most important problems first. And the most important thing, Jim Barksdale would say, keep the main yeah. thing, the main thing. And and you know this is for and you know and, and you know this and and you know you've been an advisor for us as well. Is you know and on some level we're not for profit, but on some level we're also kind of a Silicon Valley tech startup. That's and, and and competing for engineers. We're competing for engineers. We're competing for mindshare and 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 everything else. Uh, um, and and. There's a temptation, you know, and we've debated this in our own organization, you know, as recently as, you know, a couple of days ago. It's like, what's our priority? Is it to get to 100 million users as quickly as possible? Is it to make sure that every school uses us? Or is it to make sure that people are definitively learning in the best possible way on the site? And the, and the one thing that we've come to the conclusion is, I, I think our role, and I think this is why it's important to be a not-for-profit, because sometimes in the for-profit world, there'll be other forces that might drive you towards growth because that's going to affect your next round or uh, that might drive uh, in some other direction. But as a not-for-profit, we're like, no, I, I actually think, and this is, you know, this is the mindset I had in 2005 where I didn't think that any of this was ever going to happen. I just sure. said, look, let me see if I can make something that genuinely helps my cousins. And so we want to hopefully maintain that, that the single most important thing that we can do is make, a, make something that definitively moves the bar for uh, initially K through 12 math, then later math general, and then later, you know, maybe all of STEM, and then, you know, if we're talking five, ten years from now, uh, you, you know, as many subjects as possible. So let's do some fast facts on Khan. It's a nonprofit. How many people do we have? What's our expense, our, our, our budget? What, 
are, are you going to monetize Khan in some ways? How do you think about all that? We're right now uh, a little over 40, 40 full-time employees. We have 20 interns. We have uh, like 30 teachers who are helping us make content and researchers who are running literally cognitive experiments on the site. Uh, but 40 full-time. Uh, but, but, but 90 all told. 90 all told. Well, actually, we have 14,000 people translating our videos. Whew. So in, in some ways, there's many, many people part of this. And in how many languages are the videos? There's been <laughs> subtitling and translating pretty much in every world language, and, and uh, I think there's, we even have some, some examples of that. Um, Klingon. What was that? Klingon. So, <laughs> yes. So we, we've, made, we've made our site internationalizable, yes. and there's a group that started translating it into Klingon. So, okay, that's good. Yes, so no, you were joking, but they are people who take this very seriously. Um, the internet's a wonderful thing. <laughs> Yeah, so right now we're... Back, back, back to 90 people in 14,000. Yeah, so we're, we're a little over, I think, a, 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 we're about a 12 million a, a year annual budget. And, I, you know, the way we see ourselves is, you know, over the next five years, we're kind of heads down. Let's make sure that we solve that most important problem. Actually try to move the bar. I mean, you, you know, you said people... Well, we're, the idea of what we're doing is not new. People, when radio came out, people were like, hey, this is going to solve our education problems. We'll put the best lecturers on the radio and disseminate the information. Didn't happen. When TV came out, same thing. When the VCR came out, now it's on demand. Uh, when the PC came out, people were like, oh, this is going to be the interactive tool. This is going to be the tre Steve Jobs famously. This is going to be the treadmill for the mind. And, you know, it, it never really moved the bar. And so our, our mindset is in the next five years, let's get the best possible people to work on the problem and let's make sure. And we, we, you know, we think there already is evidence that it's moved the bar, but let's make it definitive that it's moving the bar. But in terms of sustainability, we do hope to become sustainable in some way. Uh, never compromising the free part for, we, we don't want the learning to ever have a wall in front of it, but we are starting to license our, we, we, you know, we, we've inadvertently kind of started to build a brand in this I, space. I, you have built a and, brand, and, I would oh, say so. Yes. And, and um, <clears throat> yeah, we look at, you know, we look at like, you know, actually Sesame Street has done quite well uh, with, with Elmo dolls. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if, <laughs> Sal, I would have quite the same, we, we, could, we could call it unibrow. It would, it would be a very, um, but, but, but we are licensing content. Uh, we are, you could imagine the tools maybe could somehow be, a uh, credentialing could be an interesting All space. the while you're a nonprofit. All while we're a sure. nonprofit. But, right. but monetizable. And you have some global partnerships, right? Yeah, you know, when, when all of this started, I mean, as early as fall of 2010, uh, you know, it, it was, it was in a, actually it was in a conversation with Google that they said, well, what would you want to where this to go, and, I, and I, I, I told Google the same things that I told the Gates Foundation, let's build an interactive platform, let's have diagnostics, let's use analytics to actually prove what's working, what's not. And, um, and I said, you know, and it also might be pretty cool if we internationalize the site. And, and so they said, oh, we're intrigued by that. So we started translating the videos uh, two years ago, and so that, we actually have more videos in other languages than we have in English now. And now we are starting to actually internationalize the platform itself. Uh, we're working with the Carlos Slim Foundation in Latin America. Uh, in the next really couple of weeks, you're going to see a full, uh, with their, they're helping us translate a lot of the site. Uh, you'll see a fully Spanish Khan Academy, everything, videos, exercises. Uh, shortly after that, a fully Brazilian uh, uh, Portuguese wow. Khan Academy. Um, and then Arabic, Hindi, Mandarin, on and on and on. It's mind blowing. Tell me this, I'm very interested, is Khan Academy meant to be supplemental? or mainstream education, and what's going on in classrooms as a consequence of that? Yeah, it's an interesting question, and, and, and there's not an easy, you know, I always, whenever someone asks it, I always like go back with the question is if, you know, if, if there's a student who is in a formal, let's say, calculus class, but is having trouble understanding the material, but then goes to a supplemental resource and learns the material there, what is, you know, may, maybe that is more important for that student and, and, and one or the other. So I, I think it's someplace in between. I, I, I view us as not, the, not somehow competing with the classroom. I see us as competing with the tools for the classroom. So uh, I, I think we could be a very important core tool for a teacher. So how does a classroom or a teacher's work change when they're embracing Khan? So in a traditional, in a traditional model, uh, what, and the, the one most of us grew up in, you know, we're group, <laughs> pat, grouped by age, uh, you have lecture, homework, lecture, homework, lecture, homework. Homework you're usually doing on your own. A lecture, you're kind of, it's kind of a passive experience. Tests, quizzes. Tests. On that test, you get an A, I get a B, uh, you get a 70, you know, a C. 
And uh, even though that test identifies those gaps in the learning, sure. uh, you move on to the next concept. So you, you didn't know 20% of exponents. Too bad. Let's not move on to negative move, exponents. Move right on down. Move them. right on down. And you know, I, 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 you know, the analogy I draw is imagine if we did other things that way, like, like home building. So <laughs> you, you. What would that be like? I you, can't quite imagine it. <laughs> you bring the contractor in. in and you yeah. say, I'm told we have three weeks to build this foundation. Do what you can. And they, they do what they can. Maybe it rains. Who knows? Inspector shows up and says, well, the concrete's still wet there. That part's not quite up to code. I'd give it a 80%. And you say, oh, great, that's a C. Let's build the first floor. <laughs> and then same, same exact thing. You know, maybe the workers don't show up. And you keep going. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, when the whole thing collapses, if, if your reaction is the reaction we have to education, you say, oh, we had, it was a horrible contract. Or maybe that's part of it. But, or you say, we need more inspection. But what was really broken is just this model. You artificially constrained how long you had to work on something. Then you had an ins inspection, an assessment, you identified gaps, and then you ignored them. So this is really insightful. What does Khan change about that model? Well, it, you know, it, it's it, the model that I just described, you know, and I'm, I'm a little bit poking fun of it. It was a necessity. It was a necessity if you go, you know, as you know, the late 18th, early 19th century, where it was the first time that industrialized nations started to say, hey, we don't want just the nobility to get their own private tutors. We want to do mass public education, starting in Prussia, then soon in the US and in Japan. And it's no coincidence that these are the, the powers that really uh, uh, blossomed. Uh, but how do you do that in a cost-effective way? Well, it was the early stages of the Industrial Revolution. How do you do anything at scale with reasonable quality? You batch the things together. You have some set, very scientific-seeming process. You kind of spray processes. At some point, you have some product that looks good. You know, These oranges are going to go to Whole Foods. These oranges are going to be squeezed, I guess, for a juice. I don't, know, I don't know if that's a good analogy, but the um, I'm thinking of my daughter. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so, so, but it was the only way to do it. And and you fast forward all the way today, it's, it's what we all grew up in. But the goal standard was always to personalize education, to let people go at their own pace, to master concepts before moving on, to make the classroom not about just information dissemination through a lecture, but to make it problem solving and interaction based. But before technology, there was no way to actually do that. And but would you say the world can't afford that? Well, and, and the world couldn't have, you know, if you go, the reason why student to teacher ratio is such an important ratio in, in a lot of people's <laughs> minds is because it's the idea that if you go from 30 to 1 to 20 to 1 to 10 to 1, you can start to get move in that direction. But the reality is even 10 to 1, you're still not getting there. It's still kind of everyone moves lockstep. The real gold standard is what, what, what the nobility had 400 years ago. You have an army of personal tutors who cater it to your needs. And, and what's exciting now is that wasn't practical. And there's actually, and I, in my book, I write about studies from the 20s where they did this with worksheets and they got dedicated teachers and the results were incredible, but it just wasn't practical. It was expensive. But that's what computers are good at. They're good at information dissemination. They're good at coordination. They're good at giving people data so that the teacher can walk into a room, not give the same lecture that he or she's been giving, but look at a report, see who's strong at something, let them move ahead, see who needs help, allow students to pair up with each other, get real data on what interventions are actually working versus not working. If, if a three kids are having trouble with negative exponents, I'm gonna sit down with them and have a very valuable interaction. And the key thing here is then every moment of a, of a teacher's time isn't spent grading homework, it isn't spent lecturing, it's actually interacting with students. And so what we say, you're optimizing not the, the student to teacher ratio, you're really optimizing the, the, the student to valuable time with the teacher ratio. Student to valuable time. And then Khan builds a knowledge map that relates these lessons and has criteria to move ahead. What are those? How does yeah. this map work and what are... Well, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, going back to the, the, I guess, you know, the home building analogy. Um, well, what, you know, so that was artificially constraining how long you have to learn something and when. And the variable is how well you learned it. A, B, C, D, F. Uh, we say, hey, let's do it the other way around. Let's let the variable be, you work on it when you need to, as long as you, you need. And what's fixed is that everyone learns at a very high standard. There's no reason, you should learn basic exponents really, 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 really well before you go on to negative exponents. Uh, otherwise, you'll just get more and more superficial understanding. And so we do it, as, you know, in some ways it's kind of a natural, it's what you would see in a martial art or learning music is, 
show proficiency in a more basic concept, then we move you forward. We'll have you then do it in a context switching mode. Well, as you, as you keep advancing to more and more advanced concepts, then we'll also make sure that you've retained some of the concepts that you have, you've seen in the, in the past, which, which is also sometimes missing in a, in a traditional model. Uh, so as much as possible, we're trying to make variable the, the when and how, and, and the fixed is the, the standard you're learning at. This, this book is <clears throat> at once uh, very clear and aspirational, and, and I find critical of today's educational system. Um, what, what, is the, what, what do the critics say about your approach and about this book? Is this embraced? Yeah, I, well, you know, what, what's been, well, there's two sides to that. On one level, you know, when all of this was happening in the fall of 2010, and I, when I was telling you and Ann about Khan Academy, I was telling Bill Gates, when I was telling Google about Khan Academy, I was pitching it as this supplemental resource that maybe one day could be used in schools. And what was surprising was how quickly these tools started getting adopted, first in Los Altos, now in 30,000 classrooms. And, and so on one level, it, it was been, it's very refreshing for our entire team for how quick this adoption has been. On the other hand, I think you know, I, the, 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 the couple of criticisms that, that we, we hear, one is, oh, well, this, is, there's, this isn't a silver bullet. Like, you can't... And that's one we 100% we agree with. No this silver is, bullets. No, no silver bullets. We're at the top of the first inning. We're addressing one variable of many. Uh, we, we are starting to see evidence that this is really moving the bar. We've been working in, in charter schools in Oakland. We've gotten some in interesting data from KIPP. We've been working with Los Altos. They've been measuring what's, what's been happening. So, and what's all the data and measurements telling you? It's, it's a pretty, so, so it's interesting. So I would have guessed going into this, and this is what everyone assumed, that this is only going to work for the motivated students. Motivated students being, you know, I don't know, imagining the top 20, 10, 10 or 20 percent of students. And what we saw, and this was the first pilot in Los Altos in 2010, uh, we did two fifth grade classrooms, two seventh grade classrooms. Los Altos is a broadly affluent area. The two fifth grade classrooms were just the traditional Los Altos demographic. The two seventh grade classrooms were a remedial math class. And for the most part, these were kids from the the other side of the railroad track, so, so to speak. They had gaps. They had huge gaps. They had, the, you know, so lot, many of them were diagnosed with learning disabilities and whatever else. And, and I was actually nervous about that class. I was like, maybe this won't work, this whole self-paced learning thing. And what, what was surprising to all of us, and it was a small cohort, we've since run bigger ones, but this was a pretty telling story, the whole distribution moved in the right direction. So it wasn't even this, the, the distribution spreading out, the smart kids getting smarter and the slower kids just falling behind. And the other thing that, no one had expected is that one kid in that remedial math class, and this had never happened, that they had never seen this, became an advanced student. He had, he had leapfrogged not even you know, average students. He had, he had progressed three or four grade levels in, in, the, in, the, in the span of, of one interview. It was actually a six-month uh, period. And, and when, when they saw that and they saw the whole distribution move and they saw in the fifth grade classrooms that there was also improvement, that's why the district wanted to go district-wide. Um, since then, you know, Oakland Unity is a charter school. And if anyone's interested, if you do a, a web search for Oakland Unity, you'll see kind of their data on it. Uh, but they've, they've been seeing very similar things. And, and what's been very satisfying for us is it's not just the, about the test scores. I mean, test scores are, are they are what they are. They're objective, so that matters. But it, what the teacher talks a lot about is that the mindset of the student's changing. In a traditional model, kind of sit, kids sit back, it's passive. They're getting lectured at. What do I do next, teacher? Oh, when is this due, et cetera, et cetera. But now the, it's the student setting the goals. Hey, I want to achieve that. The student gets help from their peers. The teacher is a resource. It's more like a coach. And I, and I point out in the book, why is it that traditionally there tends to be this antagonistic relationship between a student and a teacher, especially, say, a math teacher, and why is there this camaraderie between the student and a coach? And a coach is making students do harder things. You know, I was, I was on a wrestling team in high school, and you know, the coach will literally say, like, I want you to do 50 push-ups, you know, go up and down those stairs 50 times, and you go, yes, sir. And, and the math teacher says, okay, guys, I want you to do every other problem between 1 and 10. No, no, we don't want to do that. <laughs> and, 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 and I think the fundamental difference is is that you perceive your coach as someone who is with you, preparing you for battle against an intense world, while unfortunately because, and I don't think this is what teachers want, I think teachers want to be that coach, but there's too often students perceive their teacher as the person who's going to try to hold them back, the gatekeeper, the person who's going to try to flunk them, and that leads to that antagonism. But if you go to a model where the student is setting the goals and the teacher is there to help them achieve their goals, then it goes more to that, that, that coach relationship. And are you seeing the teachers move towards being coaches in the classrooms where you're 
What do you do to go into classroom? Do you, do you prep the teachers or do you just give them the tools and off they go? It's a, um, so, so you know, when Let's I say focus 30, on those teachers. When, when I say 30,000 classrooms, it's a huge spectrum of how it's being used. Some teachers, professors will literally just go, you know, day one and, hey, there's this site, khanacademy.org, it might help you. Now, <laughs> let, now let me just progress with the, with the, with the class. Uh, some say it's a supplemental thing and sign me up as your coach so I can keep track of what you're doing. Some say I'll give you a little bit of extra credit if you do it. Uh, while some go all in and they say, hey, look, this is how we're going to structure the class. You go at your own time and pace. When we come to class, we're all going to work together. We're going to do peer tutoring. I'm going to go from, from student to student. I'm going to, those of you who are showing leadership qualities, who know the material, you're going to take on responsibility and, and start working with other students. Uh, so, so it's the entire spectrum. And, and, I, and I think that last piece is, is still is probably the smallest chunk, but it's the one that hopefully as people see more and more examples and they see more and more evidence, uh, and that those are the classrooms where we are seeing the dial move the most, uh, that, that that will become more. And it's not going to be overnight. I don't think this is a five-year thing. I think this is going to be a, I think in five years, this idea of this being the best practice, that you shouldn't give one pace fits all lectures anymore, that you shouldn't just promote someone who kind of didn't understand algebra into pre-calculus, I think that's going to be understood as, yes, you, one shouldn't do that. I think it'll take some time for people to migrate, for them to kind of give up their, you know, 20-year-old lecture notes and say, hey, maybe I'm willing to go to class and let a little bit more chaos, but more personalized chaos happen for the students, uh, be kind of more of a competency-based model. But I, I think over the next 10 or 15 years, it'll become, it'll become mainstream. So what's your vision for Khan Academy in the next 10 to 15 years? Where do you dream, where do you plan it will be? Um, well, you know, I think the, 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 the most important thing for us is we just have to make sure that math is just thoroughly, comprehensively done really, really, really well. As part of that, we're already super focused on implementing the Common Core at a deep level. And we're not doing, you know, we're, we're not doing it for kind of the assumed reasons. You know, I think a lot of publishers might say, oh, the Common Core, 42 states, we got to sell into those 42 states. Let's map our content to it and, and, and try to sell it. We're saying, you know, at first we were skeptical. What is this Common Core? Is this real? But then when we saw what they mean, we're like, this is a really good mathematics standard. It's really deep. It's really measuring whether students understand it. And so we say, this is the standard that we want to build for. It's really good that 42 states are going to adopt it. And it's an opportunity for us because when that adoption happens next fall, the, a, a year from, roughly a year from now, uh, it's, it's going to lead to a lot of confusion. And if we can go out there and give a reference curriculum, if we can give reference tools, if we can, if we can get to the point where a teacher can just at any point in, her, in his or her class look at a diagnostic and understand how students line up against common core standards mm -hmm. um, or, or against That's even exciting. other things like That's the SAT powerful. or APs, right. then, then that could be a very So let's thing. move beyond the common core yeah. to the rest of the world. Is the rest of the world's education system a lot like the U.S. or a lot different? And what does that mean for Khan? Well, you know, the, the funny thing is whenever we, com we compare ourselves against the rest of the world and it's this... There's, there's this urgency, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we're right behind the Estonians in factoring polynomials, which <laughs> is actually true. We're right behind the Estonians in factoring polynomials. Um, the, the, uh, there, there tends to be this, oh, America's going to lose its primacy and all of that. I'm actually less worried about that, because one thing I point out, even though, our ma even though that's happening, the amount of innovation that's happening in America is getting more and more focused, or the amount of innovation in the world is getting more and more focused in the U.S. Yeah. Um, but, what, but the issue at, at stake is within the U.S. and the globe a, as a whole, that innovation is happening from a more and more concentrated group of people. And so you worry about equity and you worry about access. So yes, whether we're talking about uh, uh, the U.S. or the rest of the world, that's a very serious push for us. You know, uh, your question about where we want to be in five or ten years, I hope it's in every language, every major subject, provably works. Uh, you know, people say, I can't imagine learning subject X without, without, Khan. without Khan Academy. How and, many students? You know, I don't, it's, it's not in our control where the awareness goes, but, you know, you could, we're at six million unique now. If we get, you know, as, especially as accessibility improves with, with mobile and WiMAX and third world countries, you could start imagining it, 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 it could go to the tens of millions or hundreds of millions, you know, 50 years, who knows? It, it's a, it's a, it's a, it could be a very large numbers. And, and there's another element here, and, and, you know, we were talking about it earlier with this, you know, with, with some of the work that's been happening in Mongolia, there's some incredible kids out there who just need an outlet and who need to be identified. And we're already seeing in the data, look at that kid. She's off the charts. We, someone should go talk to them or, yeah. or nurture them. Why don't, why don't you show us that video about Khan globally? Tell us that story. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and just as a, as a little bit of an um, introduction, so, so this video 
One, it, it shows the translation efforts that are going on. So you'll see what the videos look like in other languages. We actually have 7,000 videos in languages that are not English, uh, but we're also fully internationalizing the site, the exercises, the teacher tools. And, and what this video ends with, it's, a, it's this young woman um, from Mongolia. And, and I like to show this one because it's, it's like we're living in the middle of a science fiction book. Um, you know, I used to give talks and like two years ago and say, hey, you know, maybe one day this will be used in Mongolia. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and six months later, I get that video. And that video is this young girl. Her name is Zaya. And, you know, it's just a kind of a thank you video. And I immediately assume, oh, she must be middle class, upper middle class, that she has access to the internet. She's, she speaks English quite well. And then I read the text of her email, and it turns out there was a group of engineers from Cisco Systems who were going out to Mongolia and setting up computer labs in orphanages. And she was an, uh, at a girls' orphanage. She was one of the orphans, started using Khan Academy. And that by itself was pretty crazy. But then she is now, she's 17 years old now, uh, she's now our, our number one creator of content in the Mongolian language. So she's, uh, I told her I'd write a recommendation. So <laughs> oh yeah, well, let's play, let's play the video. Yeah. <laughs> Mas é claro que ele fez muitas e muitas e muitas outras coisas importantes. That's beautiful. Thank you. One, one last topic, Saul. What's your vision for education in 2060, 50 years from now? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think, I think you know, this is I, a story, and we're starting to get more and more letters like this every day and videos like that every day. It, it, it kind of foreshadows the direction we're going, is that this, um, this idea of education, it's historically been the key determinant of the haves and the have-nots. It's historically been very expensive. It's historically been scarce. Uh, and, and what's exciting about what I think, and I definitely think this is the next 50 years, I, I, this I'm 99% I'm sure, um, that thing that was very scarce, we can start to give more and more broadly, and, 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 and it'll be in a much more powerful way than we've ever thought about charity in the past. In the past, when we thought about charity, we always said, what do the middle class have, or what do the upper middle class have? And we're like, okay, well, that's nice, but that's expensive. Let's create a cheap approximation for... For, for, for the kids in India or the kids in Africa, wherever they might be. And what's exciting about this world we're getting into is um, I, I, it won't be the cheap approximation. I mean, we're, we're serious. We, you know, we will be able to get to a world where literally, I mean, it sounds almost strange saying this, an orphan in Mongolia will be using the exact same tools as, as Bill Gates's children. And, and, uh, that's, and, 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 you know, and, and I mean, it's just, I read a lot, as you could probably tell, I, I read a lot of science fiction, and... <laughs> and, it's, and, it's, and I think, it's, it's, I think you're writing some, also. Uh, maybe, 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 well, <laughs> but, but imagine what happens. I mean, it, 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 imagine what happens if we can get there, um, if we can increase the number of people on the planet who understand um, quantum physics by a factor of 10, the number of people on the planet who are capable of um, understanding how proteins fold by a factor of 10. Uh, we could literally accelerate you know, every other aspect of, 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 of what's going on. So I think it could be a very exciting time to live. Let's summarize this journey, if we can. From uh, a single parent family in a poor town in Louisiana, to MIT, to a hedge fund, to tutoring your cousin, working out of your closet, quitting your job, and in three years, 250 million lessons, and a completely new vision for education in the future in this book, One World Schoolhouse. Please join me in congratulating Sal Khan. <laughs>